easier. Ah, okay, good. It's not amplifying. <laughs> so I'd love to join the conversation, but... <laughs> <laughs>
and welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Eric Gomez. Welcome to our book forum today to discuss this lovely piece of scholarship, uh, China's Gambit, the Calculus of Coercion by Katian Zhang. Um, I've, my name is Eric Gomez. I'm a senior fellow here at the Cato Institute, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Uh, China's coercive actions, both in its own region and around the world, I think are getting increasingly more attention from the press, from policymakers. It seems like you can't really go very far these days without hearing some kind of story about how China is behaving um, aggressively or badly on the international system in order to advance its interests. Right now, there's a coercive action going on around the offshore island of Kinmen, uh, where the Chinese Coast Guard is sort of actively going around the island after an incident a few days ago um, where a Chinese national died in like a, a, a boating incident near the island uh, and was sort of broke the law and was chased by the uh, Taiwanese Coast Guard. China did military exercises around Taiwan in 2022 after Nancy Pelosi visited and tried to sort of instigate a, a sort of new straight crisis to voice their displeasure at that. Earlier than that, in the last decade, um, I focus a lot on the Korean Peninsula, and I remember China using economic sanctions to coerce South Korea over the missile defense system that we installed there about 10 years ago. So it's something that you keep hearing about. It's something that you keep encountering, even if you're not one of the, uh, some of the group of us that get to study this stuff day in, day out in Washington, D.C. And so understanding the why, the how, and the when of Chinese coercion is therefore very important, right? We need to have an accurate sense of what is going on in order to properly deal with it. And Katian's book tries, tries to provide some answers to these questions. Um, it puts forward a new theory called uh, cost balancing theory to try to explain how China coerces, why it coerces, and when it coerces. And she shows through very detailed and meticulous case studies. One of my, my favorite part of the book was all the case studies. Um, I learned several new things that I didn't know before about things I thought I knew quite a lot about. Uh, that shows that China is actually rather selective about how it, how it coerces, and it also doesn't always coerce under similar circumstances. I've, it offers a lot of insight, it offers a lot of valuable takeaways for both scholars of this issue and policymakers dealing with it, and I'm really happy to have her here today. How the event will go, Katian will begin by giving a, a presentation about the main arguments in her book, um, followed by comments from Jude Blanchett, um, Katian is an assistant professor at George Mason University and the author of the book, and Jude <coughs> is the Freeman Chair in China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, here in DC. After each of them give their presentations, we'll go to a moderated Q&A period until 1 p.m. when our event ends. Um, for the in-person audience, you can ask questions by just raising your hand. We'll get a mic to you. Please wait for the mic so that way it can be picked up on our recordings. And then for the online audience, you can submit questions in a couple ways. If you're watching on the Cato Institute website, you can submit questions using the, uh, the window on the website below the video of this. And if you're watching on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, please write your question in a comment and use the hashtag CatoFP, capital C, capital FP. Um, all right, that's it. Thank you very much. And if you would please join me in welcoming uh, Katian Zhang to uh, give her talk. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for uh, having me today here, and it's really an honor. So today I'm going to uh, spend some time uh, talking about the main arguments of my book titled China's Gambits, the Calculus of uh, Coercion. Um, but before I begin, I would like to just give you uh, a data set that I've collected about China's coercion from uh, 1990 to uh, 2020. Let's see if you can see the slides here. So the gray bars here are coded as um, China's coercion. And by coercion, I mean the use or threats of negative actions to demand a change in the behavior of, of the target states. So we can see that over the past three decades, the frequency of China's coercion has been on the rise which is not surprising given how much power China has grown over the years. But what's more interesting is when we take a look at the tools of China's coercion. So same figure, but broken down into different kinds of coercive tools. The orange bars that you see here are cases of China's um, non neutral coercion and the blue bars, neutral coercion. So we can see that um, in the 1990s, China used neutral coercion about half of the time 
An example would be the missile testing over uh, the Taiwan Strait. And beginning 2000s, the frequency of China's coercion increased. But interestingly, China has been overwhelmingly utilizing non-militarized coercive tools in lieu of military coercion. An example would be the use of economic sanctions. So this is the banana ban that China imposed against Filipino banana exports to China over maritime disputes in the South China Sea in 2012. And another example would be the use of gray zone coercion. And this is the uh, China's use of its uh, maritime surveillance ships, the predecessor to the Chinese Coast Guard ships, also in the South China Sea. So there's variation over the tools of China's coercion. And an additional aspect of China's coercion that also puzzles me would be about the targets of China's coercion. So let's uh, stick with this South China Sea theme and take a look at an internal map that I got from the Chinese Academy of Sciences when I was doing field work a couple years back. And the white-ish area in the middle that you see is uh, uh, the South China Sea, and the black dashed line that you see here is China's night dashed line. Essentially, China claims all of the land features within uh, and maritime rights from within the night dashed line. And towards the bottom, you're going to see some orange dots. And these are Malaysian oil fields. And there are a lot of them within the Nine Dash Line. To your right, you're going to see one single purple dot. And that's the Philippine oil field. And there is only one within the Nine Dash Line. Now, the question for you then is, of these two countries, which would China be coercing more harshly and uh, frequently? So let me ask, by raise of hands, uh, Team Malaysia here, anyone? Uh, team Philippines? And the rest would be abstainers? <laughs> that is very much in line with China's uh, voting records at the UN. Uh, I, I read the, the red, I won't, I won't give it away. <laughs> um, so, so the winner is um, Team Philippines one. China coerces the Philippines a lot more harshly and frequently than it does with regard to Malaysia. But if you were me, I was Team Malaysia when I was looking at this map initially because of how many oil fields uh, Malaysia has within the Nine Dash Line. But I was wrong. So the variation over the tools and targets of China's coercion led me to answer this central question for the book, which is when, why, and how does China coerce when faced with perceived threats to its national security? And in the book, I offer the cost balancing theory to examine China's coercion, <clears throat> placing coercion in an era of global economic interdependence. And argue first that China coerces one target state in order to deter other states from doing similar things that it does not like in the future. And second, I would argue that coercion is more likely when the need to establish a reputation for resolve is high, but the economic cost of coercing the target state is low. And by the need to establish resolve, I mean concerns about appearing weak and unresolved vis-a-vis -vis other states if no coercive action or threat is used. And finally, I would argue that China prefers to use non-militarized coercive tools when the geopolitical backlash cost is high. And by geopolitical backlash, I mean concerns that a dispute might escalate into a militarized confrontation if um, military coercion is used. So this oftentimes leads China to adopt Goldilocks choices. That is, using coercion, but for fear of escalation, it kept it at the non-militarized level. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to first talk about the concept of coercion very briefly, and then explain the theory a little bit more in detail, um, and then use some empirical data to illustrate uh, the empirical uh, cases um, in, in the book. And of course, in the q and I'll be more than happy to talk about any of the um, issue areas, such as uh, maritime disputes, Taiwan, Tibet, among other things um, that you're interested in. So, in terms of the concept of coercion, I define coercion as the use or threats of negative actions to demand a change in the behavior of the target state. And for those of you who read or know Tom Schelling, um, it's true that Schelling defines coercion in, both, in, in terms of both compellence and deterrence, but for the book, coercion here refers to uh, compellence. And there is a full spectrum of coercive tools that states, including China, can utilize. So the first kind would be diplomatic sanctions, 
An example can be canceling senior level meetings between the two countries or more extremely embassy closure or cutting ties completely. And the second kind of tool could be economic sanctions. The banana ban that I introduced earlier can be an example, but more extremely states can engage in embargo as well. So what straddles these strictly non-military and military coercion is what I call gray zone coercion. And it's the use or threats of civilian law enforcement organizations to inflict potential physical damage on the target state. So think China's use of its uh, maritime surveillance ships or the successor, the Coast Guard ships in the South China Sea. And of course, it's broader than that as well. And finally, states, including China, can escalate to military coercion. And the missile testing over the Taiwan Strait could be an example. Now that we've talked about the concept, let me get to the cost balancing theory a little bit more in detail, just to explain uh, the logic of the theory. So the theory answers two questions. First, when and why China coerces, and second, what tools is more or less likely to utilize. And let's get to the one question first. The underlying assumption of the cost balancing theory is that in an era of global economic interdependence, coercion decisions are a result of balancing security and economic factors. So on the one hand, states care about external security. And if we follow the logic of establishing resolve and signaling, then China might feel the need and pressure to use coercion in order to demonstrate to the other states that it's resolved and committed to defend its national security interests. And China might fear that if no coercive action or threat is used, then other states might interpret this inaction as unresolved and weak, especially if the dispute at hand is hyped heavily reported through international media, because that means everybody's watching China's reaction or lack thereof. So this might call for the use of coercion. But on the other hand, coercion does carry with it costs. And I would argue that the primary cost would be economic. Because if we follow the logic of um, the, uh, the discussions about economic interdependence and more recently weaponized interdependence, then because China is an economically integrated state <coughs> and is part of the global production and supply chains, then it has to take into consideration the potential negative economic consequence of using coercion. And therefore, coercion decisions can be visualized in a, a decision tree. So first off, um, as you can see from the top, China will need to decide the level of the need to establish resolve. And if the need to establish resolve is low, we're more likely to see China refraining from coercion. But if the need to establish resolve is high, then China will need to consider the economic cost of coercing the target state. And if the economic cost is low, we're more likely to see China using coercion. Now, some of you might be wondering, what about the circumstances when the need to establish resolve and economic cost are both high. I argue that that's when the issue importance variable comes into play. So issue importance is the stakes that states attach to certain issues. Empirically, in the case of China, there is a very strictly defined interest hierarchy, with Taiwan and Tibet being the core interests, and other issues such as the rocks that I'm very interested in in the South China Sea, they're important issues, but they're not at the level of core interests individually themselves. So I argue that it's only when the issue importance is the highest that we're more likely to see China using coercion. And when the issue importance is lower, um, China has more room for maneuver to refrain from coercion when the need to establish resolve and economic cost are both uh, high. So in the book, especially in the Taiwan chapter, I examine the issue importance variable uh, in detail. But um, for uh, the talk, I'm going to be zooming in more so on the circumstances when the costs are not equally high. But I'll be more than happy to talk about other scenarios and cases um, in the Q&A as well. Now, let's shift gear to the second question, which is about the tools of China's coercion. Here, I argue that uh, geopolitical backlash is the central variable. And by geopolitical backlash, I very much follow the logic of uh, concerns about balancing. So if China is aware that other states uh, could be potentially balancing against China by either forming or strengthening alliances with external great powers, say empirically, for example, the United States, then China has to take into consideration the potential that uh, a dispute might escalate to militarized confrontation if military coercion is used. 
especially if the target state has mutual defense treaties with that external great power, think the United States. So when the geopolitical backlash cost is high, we're more likely to see China using non-militarized coercive tools for plausible deniability purposes. But when the geopolitical backlash cost is low, China has more room for maneuver uh, to use military coercion, which is oftentimes what we see in the Sino-Indian land border dispute uh, cases, where military coercion has been used. So this concludes our discussion of the theory itself. Now you might, w might be wondering, what about the sources and pieces of evidence that you utilize for at the book? Well, here we go. Um, so these are the 50 pounds of books that I hauled from China after a trip to China in spring 2023. And on top of the pile of books is a red steady notebook for the Chinese Communist Party's 20th Party Congress. And of course, I didn't use uh, these books for the book on coercion, but I am utilizing some of them for my uh, second book project on rise in power grant strategies. But I do utilize primary Chinese language sources for the, uh, the book on coercion as well, in addition to the objective indicators um, that I'll be more than happy to talk about in the Q&A as well. So I do utilize different kinds of sources as well as interviews to cross-check and triangulate so that I'm not biased against one source over another. Now, um, enough about the boring theory stuff, but let's get to the empirics a little bit before I conclude. Um, like I said earlier, we're going to be zooming in on empirical cases in the South China Sea. So let's take a look at figure two, which tracks challenges from other disputants in the South China Sea from 1990 to 2020. So the blue bars that you see here are coded as incidents, by which I mean actions taken by the other disputants in the South China Sea. Just for context, the South China Sea has multiple disputants, for example, China, Malaysia, Vietnam, Brunei, um, the Philippines, and uh, Taiwan um, as well. And these actions, however, are not necessarily actions that tilt the military balance of power. Rather, they're oftentimes actions taken by other disputants that are aimed at strengthening the administrative control of the other countries. Uh, claims in terms of maritime dispute, maritime rights, as well as land features in the South China Sea. And China considers these actions as diminishing China's own sovereignty and maritime claims within the South China Sea. And let me just give you some brief concrete examples. So in the 1990s, if you can see this little uh, a blue bump here, um, that tend to include actions such as Vietnam occupying a new land feature in the South China Sea, and in between 2000 and 2005 or so, you might be seeing a little bit of like a, a dip here, a slight decrease. And these tend to include actions that are way more demure, much less dramatic than compared to the 1990s. An example would be a Malaysian politician landing on a land feature that it has already occupied since the 1990s. And starting from around 2007, we're seeing a slight uptick again. And these tend to include actions such as um, the, the Philippines signing an oil and gas contract in the South China Sea with a foreign uh, company. So this is the same figure, but I added China's coercion in relation to these um, incidents in red. Um, we can see that in the 1990s, China used coercion, but selectively, not responding to every single incident that China considers as threatening. And some of these 1990s cases of China's coercion were actually militarized. And in between 2000 and 2006 or so, uh, China refrained from coercion. And starting from 2007, China began to use coercion again, again, selectively, not responding to every single incident. And none of the post-2007 cases of China's coercion were militarized. At best, China used gray zone coercion. So in the book, I conducted a congruence test and basically to demonstrate that temporal changes and uh, variations in patterns of China's coercion track with uh, the, uh, the temporal changes in the independent variables of the cost balancing theory. So think about need to establish resolve economic cost and geopolitical backlash. And I've also conducted a paired comparison of two cases, um, the first one being the 2012 Scott Marshall incident between China and the Philippines, where China used coercion. But interestingly, the exact same incident took place in 2001, where Chinese fishermen were arrested by the Philippine Navy personnel, again over the Scott Marshall, but the only difference was that China refrained from coercion in that case. 
more than happy to talk about these specific case studies um, in the Q&A, but I don't think I'm gonna have time to sort of elaborate more on them here, um, but I do discuss um, these maritime disputes uh, in the South China Sea, as well as over uh, Japan, um, sorry, the Senkoku Islands uh, in the East China Sea, vis-a-vis -vis Japan, and issues surrounding Taiwan, something that Eric has a lot more expert uh, expertise in, in <laughs> than I am, um, uh, as well as issues uh, surrounding Tibet. But just to briefly conclude, um, the book examines when, why, and how China coerces other states. And I argue that China oftentimes makes Goldilocks choices. What that means is that China balances between the need to establish resolve and the economic cost of using coercion uh, while taking into consideration potential geopolitical backlash. And this suggests that a globalized economy provides both opportunities and constraints for rise in power behavior, including China's coercive action. And I should also add that this Goldilocks logic very much manifests itself in some of my ongoing work. For example, China's preference for forming strategic partnerships as opposed to formal alliances with defense treaties. And second, um, I, would also, I would also argue that China prefers to use coercion as a signal device, and oftentimes demonstrating this compelling to deter kind of dynamic, which Chinese interviewees describe as uh, killing the chicken in order to scare the monkeys. But if I were to paraphrase, I think it would be more like scaring the chickens in order to scare other monkeys, with the Philippines being a, a, a chicken, for example. But please don't ask me the relationship between the chickens and the monkeys. Um, I don't know why they're related, but I think it's just an <laughs> analogy uh, from, from the zoo. So thirdly, I would also like to um, emphasize here that um, the book also speaks to the broader literature that moves beyond military coercion to examine non-traditional forms of coercion, including gray zone coercion, which actually has a lot of um, uh, generalizability beyond China to, for example, Russian gray zone coercive actions. And finally, um, the last point that I wanted to emphasize here is that linear power growth GDP, for example, where military power is an important variable, but at the same time, it's oftentimes insufficient to explain the foreign policy behavior of rising power. So we do need to have a little bit more nuance to understand other kind of potential factors as well. And very quickly on um, uh, policy implications, uh, if I may, I think there are two, and the first one for the United States would be um, there might be a better strategy um, that I would call quiet to rebalancing in the Indo-Pacific. What that means is more actions, less talk which reduces China's pressure to establish resolve, but increases China's geopolitical backlash. And secondly, um, I would also argue that the United States might have a uh, more targeted leverage by keeping China in the production and supply chains and keeping China continuously vulnerable and dependent on key US um, technologies. That pretty much sums up my uh, discussion about um, the book. Thank you again for having me, and I look forward to um, any comments as well as Jude's um, uh, comments. Thank you, Katia. Uh, Jude, take it away when you're ready. Well, um, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, also noting that I've been to events that have started two or three minutes late. I've never been to an event that has started two minutes early. So uh, just <laughs> congratulate, hats off to the uh, efficiency with which you run uh, these events. Um, I also just want to congratulate Kotian for a really rich and rewarding um, book, both on the theory, but also, as Eric mentioned, some really important illustrative um, case studies that explain and I think lay out a really interesting um, and compelling framework to think about um, China's uh, behavior. I just have a few thoughts, um, hopefully to build on some of Kotian's work, uh, but also just questions that I would be curious to hear um, how, how Kotian thinks about them. Um, and I guess I'll start with a something of an analytic puzzle for, for those of us who work on Taiwan, which is if we were having this uh, discussion in November of last year or October of last year, I think the view would have been that if we're thinking about Beijing's response to the then upcoming Taiwan presidential election on January 13th, um, the expectation was not only amongst uh, analysts here, but including in our track two discussions with Chinese scholars, that Beijing was almost inevitably um, going to have a, a fairly aggressive response to a, a possible election by the DPP um, candidate, Lai ching to William Lai. The logic was, well, first of all, um, Beijing has spent years painting William Lai as a rabid secessionist who's, who's trying to split Taiwan from, uh, from uh, the mainland. 
Um, also, there will be a need to send an early sort of brush back pitch signal to a, a forthcoming lie administration, um, just to signal resolve. Um, uh, and also, there's going to need to be a signal to the United States, uh, essentially, to, to again, to establish resolve. What was surprising is Beijing's response was, was far less than I think a lot of us had imagined. Again, I would include in that uh, Chinese international relations scholars, uh, Taiwan scholars in, in China. Um, and so it raises a question, which is, were we wrong in our framework for thinking about uh, China's, um, uh, China's actions? Or I think, was there something missing in our uh, analysis of how China was calculating relative costs and how and why it needed to signal resolve? Um, it's almost certainly yes to the first, which is, I think, as, as external analysts, especially looking at a relatively opaque decision-making process, um, we're, we're almost always wrong. Um, and certainly, that's, that's my experience and my predictions about, about China. Um, but the second is um, inputs that we often can't see externally that are really important internally in China's decision-making. And I think it's become clear after the fact that China knew some things which, which I hadn't appreciated in advance. Number one is they had come to see the recent meeting with President Biden in San Francisco and especially the, the diplomatic channel between National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and, and Wang Yi, who's the senior uh, foreign affairs official in China, um, as being a solid good channel with which China was able to communicate its concerns and they were at least listened to. And so China had a stake in the U.S.-China relationship of not overreacting on Taiwan. And of course, related to that is the fact that it was the Biden administration who's relatively cautious and careful. They, they, they were, especially after San Francisco, a little bit less worried that there was going to be some U.S. reaction to January 13th that would put Beijing in a position where it felt like it had to reestablish resolve. Um, and the second is I think Beijing was getting a clear understanding of what the election outcome would be. And although William Lai won outright, uh, I think there are signs from the election that give Beijing some degree of optimism that time is not necessarily working against it. William Lai won only 40 percent of the vote, um, so a fairly you know, weak mandate. The legislative UN, which is Taiwan's legislature, um, the DPP does not have a majority. It has only 51 seats out of 113. So the KMT has, has more plus the KMT's ability to, to caucus with something called the Taiwan People's Party, which has eight seats, means that the DPP is going to have a relatively tough time um, in, in an election. I raise all this to say, um, in addition to the fantastic work that, that Kutian has done, just reminds me of the, the agency and subjectivity of a lot of Chinese calculations, some of which really aren't clear the logic of it until after the fact or you, you glean new, new information um, coming from those. And I find that especially apposite with the Taiwan question because, you know, a framework of low economic cost plus um, the need to signal resolve, I think explains a lot, but they're really interesting bank shots or, or shots not taken from Beijing that I think complicate um, sort of formal theories of this that really only become clear again after you get insight um, that of publicly, non-publicly available information uh, that comes later. And with an issue like Taiwan, I think Beijing, it's one of Beijing's most effective weapons that it has convinced all of us that this is an issue that is co the core of core interests in which China must signal resolve at high, at high cost and one where it will, is unbending and unwavering. And, and I think that's true to a large extent. But I also know that um, Beijing, if you look at the 75 years that Beijing has been waging uh, you know, a, a, a war to try, try to get Taiwan back, its position has shifted pretty consistently over that 75 years in ways that undercut, I think, the idea that this is the core of core interests, whether that you know, is in 1979, China fish, changed its official guidance from the need to liberate Taiwan to the need uh, to uh, achieve uh, peaceful reunification. Uh, leaders like Deng Xiaoping, who were at, as, if not maybe even more powerful than Xi Jinping, um, uh, had space to essentially say, look, l we can solve this far down the line. And by the way, this is flexibility has occurred at times where the threat from the United States to changing um, uh, or, or aiding Taiwan has been stronger than, than it is now. So it, it indicates a degree of flexibility and agency uh, that Beijing has over what we external analysts consider its core interests um, that I just raise as, as sort of an interesting issue as we think about formal models
for how and when Taiwan uh, courses. I think the second challenge um, that Kutian's work proposes is thinking about um, China's course of strategies moving forward. And to the issue of economic interdependence and China's assessment of, of economic costs and to Kutian's, I think, really sensible recommendation about the cost to us in terms of leverage if China is completely cut out of the global economy and global supply chains. Yet I wonder um, if we think about the next 10 to 15 years and Beijing's strategy right now of consciously decoupling in its own way from global supply chains and the global economy, Xi Jinping's macroeconomic strategy of building China's self-sufficiency so that it can better withstand in its own framing you know, pressure from the West and the G7, whether that's, you know, sanctions, technology controls. Um, Xi Jinping wants to be less connected to core aspects of the global economy and global supply chains because he sees those as vulnerabilities. And also the, the Chinese leadership under Xi Jinping has indicated that they're just deprioritizing growth. I mean, a large amount of the growth slowdown since 2020 is policy driven and not intentional. It's things like uh, efforts to um, uh, um, defroth the real estate sector. Um, it, it's I, I, the, the catastrophe of how, how China both managed COVID and then got out of got out of COVID. Um, but some of this is intentional, I think, in two key ways. Number one is, I think that the operative strategy in Beijing are twofold: Nas building a national security state um, and prioritizing security concerns over just growth for growth's sake. And the second is you know, trying to shift gears in China's economic model and build what they see as a, a fortress China that is also domineering in key sectors of advanced manufacturing. Um, and so Xi Jinping continually reiterates to cadres in the system, you know, comrades, this is, this is not about growth for, for growth's sake anymore. There's other considerations here. Um, and so does that mean that at the margin, Chinese perceptions of economic cost will matter less if Xi Jinping becomes you know, successful in building a, a self-reliant economy. I mean, six, I put successful in, in scare quotes because you know, North Korea has been successful in isolating its economy, but I wouldn't consider that a model of, you know, of, of, of sound economic management. Certain, certainly Milton Friedman or F.A. Hayek would not approve of the DPRK model, but I think Xi Jinping sees aspects of that which, sure, he'd like to have 10% growth and security, but I think he's clearly indicating that 10% growth was the security concern. That was bringing instability to the system. So how does that affect Chinese course of strategy in an era where they are, they are proponents of economic decoupling, even if they publicly say that, that they don't want to? And then the third is just cor course of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And this is one where I'm fairly mixed on this. On the one hand, I think China is wildly successful in a lot of its course of strategies. I also think China's wildly unsuccessful in a lot of its course of strategies. And I don't have a, um, I, I don't have a, a monotonal sort of claim here about what it does well and what it does not do well. I think it clearly on issues like Taiwan, it does really well. And I say that because we still don't have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. I mean, that, that, is, that is objective number one. And I think China has essentially managed to keep US policy on Taiwan relatively consistent over four decades, which we count as a success story. But so would China. I think they would say that they've been able, through, through, through explicit threats of violence, been able to keep the United States from uh, uh, pulling a relationship closer than Taiwan, um, than the United States would, would like to do. Um, I also think this matters greatly for third countries. Um, you know, one of Taiwan's key strategies right now is expanding its international space. So getting more and more countries to advocate for Taiwan in multilateral fora, to increase their own bilateral engagement. But um, third countries still in many ways rely on China or have deep economic interlinkages with China. And so to the killing the chicken to scare the monkey, or I forget what you're, kill the uh, monkey to scare the chicken. The chicken or, you know, I, I think that certainly holds true. And oftentimes we will consider Chinese course of actions ineffective because we're thinking about the target country and, and CSIS did a study recently, which I will politely disagree with some of here, which essentially said that China isn't effective in its economic coercion. Because if you look at target countries, more often than not, the target country doesn't fundamentally change its position on the issue that China doesn't like as a result of Chinese pressure. And I think that's probably true, but, but I wonder, it's really off, it's off screen that I think a lot of the action is.
So what third countries who are not the target of court, China's course of actions look at what China can do to bully and therefore don't take actions? And that doesn't show up in a data set, right? The, the, the country A not taking an action in support of Taiwan because it sees the threats and coercion that China applies to country B, there's just no way to, to calculate that. We just hear it sort of anecdotally. And the second is, you know, when, when states change positions, not all of those are, public, are publicly seen, right? Um, so it's hard to sort of measure the effectiveness of China's coercion. This is the Cato Institute, so people know Frederick Bastia, you know, what is seen and unseen. A lot of the cost is, is unseen. It's only known in sort of diplomatic circles of, of where an action, um, an, an action uh, wasn't taken. And then finally, you know, in the initial chart that Kotian put up that showed under Xi Jinping, or just lead up to Xi Jinping period 2010 to 2020, the massive expansion in the use of, of non-military coercion, um, it strikes me that having said what I just said about it's hard to uh, measure the efficacy, and, and oftentimes China is not effective in what it does, um, it's also just there, there's so many examples of where that non-military coercion or salami slicing or gray zone, um, they're doing more of it because in many key ways it's, it is really working. And it's working because that's the, hardest, that's the hardest toolkit that China has for, I think, Western policymakers to think of an effective countervailing strategy. And that's why you salami slice is because w what do we do to counter the salami slice, right? We're, we're limited in the tools that we have to take an action that can effectively put a price on that without escalating. Um, and so if we think about gray zone, you know, Eric mentioned some of the um, CSS, we just put out something recently about a, a Chinese scientific vessel um, that was built right next to Chinese PLA Navy ships and also has a lot of equipment, sensors, drones, which coincidentally the PLA could make use of. Um, and it is now skirting the border of, of Taiwan's 24 nautical, nautical mile sort of contiguous zone. Um, what do we do about that? Right? What do we do if, if China starts, again, just sort of probing those, the waters around Taiwan so they sort of cross the threshold of the 24 nautical mile line and maybe they get into the 12? We've seen in response to uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan in August 2022, something called the median line, which is a, a fictional device, but essentially split the Taiwan straight down the middle. And it was useful because it was a no-go zone for a long time. And it was also an effective way of measuring when China had really escalated, you know, the number of flights that had gone over, when the flights were rare. After Pelosi's visit, China just essentially flooded the Taiwan Strait, and now they're, you can still draw a median line on a map, but it has no functional meaning anymore. Just the PLA operates across the median line all the time. And, you know, there's a lot of consternation here about what do we do about that? Um, so, um, you know, in, sh in short, um, what I love about this, this book is I think it gives an incredibly convincing um, framework to think about this. And I think it also raises a lot of interesting questions which Kutian poses near the end of the book about how we should think about the behavior of China's bureaucratic system, its foreign policy. Um, and to me, I'm just left with some of these other questions really about, you know, this is a, the best study we have till 2020. And, but we're in a sort of a paradigm shift in China. Decision making, you know, the country is moving fairly rapidly towards, you know, decision making dictatorship under Xi Jinping. I don't mean that to be uh, inflammatory, but just if you functionally look at the org chart, um, Xi Jinping has rewired the system in ways that position him as a really singular actor in the system. They've built up a massive national security system since 2013, 2014, which is gonna operate in decision-making in ways that I don't think we quite understand. Um, you know, they've, they've built a, a new national security um, uh, commission, which isn't really an analog of our national security council, and we don't quite know where it sits in the decision-making space. We're seeing a gear shift in China's political economy and its economic model that would again, I think at the margin, indicate that economic price or economic costs will again at the margin matter less to China moving forward as it essentially builds up a, a wealthier DPRK state in terms of uh, uh, insulation. Um, and then the final thing is, you know, relating to Xi Jinping is just misjudgment. I think this is, this makes me have such a rational view of Chinese decision making 
that I think still holds, but I think we're already seeing that the space for miscommunication, for Chinese versions of mirroring, for Chinese miscalculation are significant. One of the things you notice in crises is that China really telescopes down, oftentimes doesn't think about the regional actors and what their equities are. Um, the system shuts down in the initial period as China tries to figure out what the right messaging is. So the system really closes up. That's always been the case. That was the case in 2001 during the, the Hainan incident, the collision between a US surveillance aircraft and, and a Chinese uh, fighter jet. Um, it's certainly the, certainly the case now. So I I'm, have learned so much from this book, and yet I still have sort of huge areas of uncertainty where I just don't know, is this the calculus? Is this the playbook for China moving forward? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, so we're going to go to a Q&A now. I'm going to try and do, like, alternate between um, the online audience questions and the in-person audience questions. Uh, to a quick reminder on ground rules for in-person audience, raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you. Please wait for the mic. If you could say your name and affiliation, that would be great. For the online audience, please either you know, write your message, write your question into the Slido page, or if you're watching on social media, write the question and use the hashtag CatoFP. Um, I would usually take moderator's prerogative, but I think most of the things I have lined up in my head kind of got asked or talked about already. Um, so we'll go with um, the in-person audience here. Uh, yes, this, uh, you in the front row, yeah. Hi, my name is Amara Villarini. I'm a student at Georgetown University, and because I study international affairs, I have a question about the international affairs of Taiwan um, specifically. So Taiwan seeks to expand its diplomatic ties. However, there's less than 20 countries currently that recognize Taiwan. Do you think that, especially in the developing world, the dependency on the Belt and Road Initiative difficults the expansion of Taiwanese diplomatic relations? Get the end, you wanna? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure thing. Um, I think that's a great question. I think in a way it relates to some of um, Ju's comments about effectiveness, or sort of um, those like observable ones. Because I think in the case of um, 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 across trade relations, China, of course, wants to prevent Taiwan from forming formal relations with other countries in the world. So in a way, China has been utilizing what I would say like a mixture of carrots and sticks um, against potential countries or targets that want to form formal relations with Taiwan, in particular, say, in those in the Latin American uh, sense, uh, Latin American countries, and other countries that were observing China's potential um, diplomatic, uh, or especially economic sanctions on those countries, um, I think, in a way, would probably be deterred from establishing, say, formal relations with Taiwan in the future. So that, in a way, gets back to Ju's point about sort of these um, interestingly uh, effective uh, 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 consequences of China using coercion. And one example could be China's economic coercion on Lithuania for establishing the Taiwan one needs represent, uh, representation office there. Um, we don't know for sure, you know, privately how other countries view that particular coercion, but I think having learned um, uh, of cases with regard to foreign leaders' reception of the Dalai Lama, which is not about Taiwan, but it's a similar kind of dynamic, a lot of countries are deterred from uh, meeting with the Dalai Lama in the future, having observed China's economic coercion on some of the um, other countries. Okay, I'm gonna do a question from the online audience. Uh, my Cato Institute colleague and Ohio State professor John Mueller is watching and he, he asked, what benefit, if any, has China gotten from its coercive efforts? I know we addressed some of this in the talk, but one question for you, Katian, especially given your access to those um, internal sort of Chinese documents and how, and the interviews you conducted as part of this research. I, I was struck while reading this of like, they're so obsessed with establishing a reputation for resolve. And this question of, well, it, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't seem to be working because um, when they try to coerce like this, the United States and, other, and the targets obviously see it as threatening behavior. And if anything, we keep, you know, the, the, the st slow but steady expansion of the US, maybe not expansion of the Alliance Network, but the deepening of it has happened. How does China view those incidents? Incidents Like, do they say, okay, we did it, we were successful in this coercive effort, but then a few years later, they start getting things like AUKUS coming into agreement. Are they, are they like questioning the value 
of that co of the earlier coercive effort? Or are they saying, well, we had to do it at the time, so it was good? Like, how do they, does China have a method for sort of self-assessing success and failure of, of these coercive actions? Mm -hmm. Um, sure. Um, I think that's a great question, and I think sort of goes back to Jude and I and, and our conversation about effectiveness. Um, so there are two layers to this question. Um, I think um, at the metaphysical level, this really suggests an inherent tension in China's grand strategy because there are sort of two opposing goals of China's grand strategy. So on one hand, it wants to establish its resolve as a great power. Um, in order to defend national security interests. But on the other hand, it also wants a relatively stable external environment for its economic growth and internal stability. So these two goals, on the one hand, will mean you might use coercion, but on the other hand, carrots, um, economic inducement. And these two goals go 180 degrees, opposite directions, which in a way ultimately reduces any uh, uh, effectiveness of China's economic sanctions or other forms of coercion in a way what we see as of now it's at best a suboptimal result of China practicing is um, statecraft but on to specific points about do does China know that it's sort of shooting itself in the foot by using course of actions I think in a way it kind of does understand that there are negative consequences which is why it chooses more like the Goldilocks uh, choice as opposed to say escalating all the way to military coercion or use of force. Um, but at the same time, if we're talking about Quad or AUKUS, um, China's understanding is that it's true these, um, uh, especially Quad, for example, uh, minilateral informal institutions have been built uh, um, in a way vis a vis China or against China, but at the same time, China's assessment at the moment is that they don't really do that much in terms of actual substance. And if we take the South China Sea as an example, China does not believe that ASEAN countries are united together against China mm -hmm. in any meaningful or physical uh, stance. So I've had contacts with um, diplomats in the Vietnamese embassy here in DC, um, and a lot of them sometimes would actually blame the Philippines for <laughs> what's going on. Like the second Thomas Shaw making statements very similar to China's logic that the Philippines is heating up the South China Sea issue, it's gaining international attention, it's creating like trouble. Um, so, and if you ask Malaysian counterparts, they'll say that they don't really wanna take sides or pick between the United States and China. So at least in this sense, um, China's coercion does not generate at least the most significant backlash yet, but it certainly generates backlash of some sort um, that going into the future, uh, it might reduce the ultimate effectiveness of Chinese um, statecraft, negative or positive. Anything to add, Jude? Or? I, I just, um, I, I think China gets a lot for its coercion, and I, I think sometimes we have two different scorecards uh, here in Washington and in Beijing. I think we'll you know, put on the sort of liability side for Beijing, the um, its its actions, which have I think you've seen a, a deterioration of China's image in polling done in the region, Lowy Institute, ICS in Singapore. You also see the it, it puts propellant behind some U.S. actions like AUKUS and the Quad. But I think China's looking out broadly. It's feeling in a fairly decent position right now. If you travel around Southeast Asia, to Kotian's point um, on issues like Taiwan. Um, there's no interest in Singapore or, or Manila even of really taking on significant risk vis-a-vis -vis China to strengthen their position around, around Taiwan. There's a lot of hedging behavior going on in the region. And in fact, in some way, for a lot of you know, small and medium powers, U.S.-China competition is quite good for them right now because they essentially have two buyers that they can, be, they can be playing off. I mean, the center of gravity when you're in the region still feels like it's China. Security-wise, it's the United States, has a thick you know, network of allies and partners, but even China growing at about 5%, you know, percent, still it is the gravitational force is significant. And again, let's just do a thought experiment. If China didn't, wasn't expending political capital to establish resolve at all, what would the region look like? I think it'd look pretty differently. I think Taiwan's relationship with countries in the region would look very differently. Um, so I think in many ways, you know, China's been incredibly effective at getting other countries to take its considerations into account when it makes decisions and not taking actions that Beijing would prefer them not to take because of that anaconda in the chandelier that Beijing has effectively created through demonstrated uses of, of compellence and coercion over decades. Did you say anaconda chandelier? 
sorry, uh, Perilink, it's the, the Chinese model is they don't always need to they don't always need to clench their fists. They're like an anaconda in the chandelier. You see them there, and you know that they could drop down at any minute. So it's just a matter of reputation and credibility. I think Beijing has effectively consolidated that, especially amongst middle and smaller powers. Final comment, even in when there's a lot of sort of, sort of, you know, um, I was going to say bluster. That's not the right word. I think we think a lot of countries in the region would take a stronger stand on some issues that comport with U.S. interests. I think we'd be surprised because behind the scenes, there's a lot of consternation around taking additional risk vis-a-vis -vis China because of decades of China establishing credibility for using force and coercion. Yeah. Anacondas, monkeys, and chickens, folks. The whole animal the whole kingdom. Zoo. Yeah, go for it. Um, so very quick point. Um, can I just have like a plug for some of the awesome work that yeah. my colleagues have done on uh, assessing China's um, uh, effectiveness of using economic sanctions, et cetera. So um, Dr. Audrey Wan at the University of Southern California and Dr. Um, Casey Mura has done a lot more on under what circumstances Chinese coercion or economic statecraft can be successful or uh, not successful. Going back to a lot of Jews coming about bureaucratic processes and internal dynamics within uh, within China. Awesome. I will take questions from the in-person audience. Um, uh, you down here in the front right, and uh, we'll, we'll go, yeah, two in the front row. Uh, Stanley Kober, I'm a former Cato Research Fellow. When I was here in 1995, I published a paper on economic security. Back then, we had no national security peer competitors, so the focus transferred to economic security. I concluded the paper by looking at the situation in Europe before the First World War. Lord Salisbury, the British Prime Minister, said every country uses access to its markets as a weapon. Countries, Britain, Germany, began to see each other not only as competitors, as national competitors, but as rivals, as threats. The economic warfare spilled over into the political uh, arena, and 20 years later, all of Europe was at war. I'm wondering whether that is where we're headed. Mm -hmm. That's why, because I just see a parallel here that is very strong. Okay, sir. Uh, how important in understanding uh, China's coercion is uh, doing a deep read of Xi's speeches over time. And what is uh, the relationship uh, to uh, China's coercion with American businesses in China? Um, yeah, uh, sure thing. So, so on to the first question. Um, that, that's a really interesting one. And um, one of our colleagues, um, Dr. Dale Copeland at UVA, has done a lot, written a lot on economic interdependence and conflict uh, propensity um, with the argument that um, um, negative trade expectations um, actually, in a way, explains the occurrence of the First World War. But my take here is that um, it's an interesting analogy, but there are also differences because contemporary economic interdependence in the form of global production and supply chains um, is very much different from the kind of economic inter interdependence that we had in the First World War uh, period, where there isn't a uh, intricate uh, production and supply chains, because this production and supply chains, um, in a way, is a conflict pacifier in the sense that um, our has a pacifying effect on a conflict propensity because, for one, it means that China could have a lot more economic leverage or leverage that does not require China to use force in the sense that it has more economic tools. Um, such that it does not have to resort to force. And second, it also means that China, if it continues to be part of the global production supply chains, it has to be concerned about supply chain stability because any conflict will have a negative impact on supply chain. And therefore, um, in a way, its use of force will be further constrained. But on to Jude's earlier uh, comment about you know what happens in the future. If we're seeing a China that's relatively decoupled from the rest of the world and relatively successful at that, I think the economic cost of using coercion or force will be much lower. And I think that's what I worry because we're going to be seeing a China that's either more like Maoist China or a much more powerful but also independent China that has much less restraint when it comes to the use of force. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the the second question on um, the uh, uh, 
the the use of coercion and sort of forgetting the second on companies. Oh, and the companies, yeah, sorry. Chinese, so, um, uh, U.S. companies. Right, right. There, there are some instances of China using coercion on um, U.S. companies, like airlines, for example, Delta, and I think American Airlines, uh, for removing certain maps about Taiwan, et cetera, and um, China coercing uh, uh, the NBA, and uh, basically threatening to take um, to ban the NBA in China if uh, it does not comply to certain um, Chinese stance on, say, Xinjiang, et cetera. Um, so um, on the one hand, China does want to maintain stable economic relationship with the business community, but at the same time we do, and we have seen China increasingly using these sort of um, economic sanctions on um, the U.S. Uh, business community for national security purposes. is getting closer to whether Xi is getting closer to move on Taiwan um, so people might, dis uh, might might have different opinions on this and and my understanding is that I don't think China's um, uh, in a rush to take Taiwan anytime soon um, partially because of uh, the military is not ready and there's a capability gap um, and partially also has to do with going back to this uh, notion of uh, supply chain uh, stability. And if China were to take over Taiwan, or at least to try, there will be a lot of uh, uh, disruption to the supply chains. Um, so my understanding at least is that I don't think she is in a rush to have any major um, actions with regard to Taiwan, which is why we've been seeing this like lower level um, course of actions that are way below the threshold of military use of force. Can I just add, I, I, yeah. think, they're, I think they're an important input into how we would frame an assessment of are the Chinese, do they think time is on their side or are they becoming more concerned? And that's why we, you know, I think a lot of folks track very carefully on any high level authoritative comment by Xi Jinping. It's an intentional signal to the outside world, but certainly to the system. And so that's why seeing differences in language that indicate, so in 2013 and again in 2019, Xi Jinping said in two, one was a letter to, called the letter to Taiwan compatriots, the other was comments when he was meeting with a KMT official. He said that the issue of reunification can't be passed down to future generations, right? So that was an important comment that seemed to indicate, I'm not gonna wait forever. Xi Jinping has also tied complete reunification um, to benchmark goals around national rejuvenation by 2049, 2050. So we look at all those and I think the assessment is um, that if you were to take all that together, basically what he's saying is, I need to inject a sense of urgency here, but I'm also not gonna box myself in with an artificial timeline. Um, I think the Chinese make these assessments on contexts more than they do you know, uh, artificial timelines. Um, the other thing I would say is, we, speeches are important, but obviously if the Chinese were at a point where they were um, so worried about the situation in Taiwan that they were gonna contemplate a strike, they're not gonna tell us. So we're gonna have to be looking for other metrics. So I think speeches are important, and I think you would begin to see language in speeches that is beginning to signal more of a sense of urgency and concern. So for example, in Xi Jinping speeches, and in high-level documents, they will usually say something like, a small number of secessionists on Taiwan you know, are basically getting in the way of reunification. If he started to say, the people on Taiwan are becoming an obstacle to reunification, that would be a linguistic shift that would be a worrisome one. But ultimately, I think we're somewhat limited in how much we're gonna have insight into Xi Jinping's actual strategy based on his speeches. You know, again, um, you know, dictators um, also can be unpredictable and they can make mistakes. So we have to listen carefully to the evidence, but there's other things that we'd be looking for, right? What other sorts of areas of mobilization would you see in the Chinese system, in the economy? Um, great, I'm gonna end on a question from the online audience. We got about four minutes, and I know Jude, you have to leave pretty much right at one, so uh, we'll try to go quickly. William Anderson asked uh, Katian, do you consider the use of the Chinese Coast Guard assets as a non-military as opposed to a military form of coercion? And I know you wrote a lot about this gray zone issue. I also had a question about sort of case selection and wondered why uh, the Chinese island building campaign wasn't mm -hmm. a case study, mm -hmm. right? Because that's more of like a, it's more of a long-term steady thing and your, your book mostly looks at sort of Chinese reactionary policies and response to threats to the interests. So I'm curious about those other types of things that we would consider coercion. Sure. 
Absolutely. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, so first off, to, to Derek's point, um, the, the land reclamation part was originally part of the dissertation, but it's too long to put in the book, so I just chucked them out. Uh, <laughs> but not, not exactly. But um, I do have a, a standing or like an individual article that examines China's land reclamation uh, rationale. Um, the reason why it's not considered as compelling actions is that I think it forms more of like a deterrent kind of um, uh, long term, as you said, deterrent kind of purpose, um, in the sense that land reclamation, it takes about two years, it's not responding to a particular incident per se, so like a fishing incident, or it's a uh, developing signing and oil and gas contract. It's really more uh, for the broader deterrence as well as the logistical resupply purposes for uh, the PLA. So it's definitely relevant, but I think it's more of like a deterrent purpose as opposed to um, uh, compellence, which is the focus of the book. And on to the point about whether um, a gray zone, so I don't think it's strictly non military. Um, that's why I think it's like an in between, sort of like a twilight. Um, category, gray zone uh, coercion, below the threshold of um, military uh, coercion. It's true that um, the, the Coast Guards, ever since 2018, have been placed under the, 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 the commission or the control of the CMC, the Central Military Commission, sorry, the People's Armed Police, the PAP, which is then controlled by the Central Military Commission, the CMC, but at the same time, there are official documents, including the Chinese, uh, China's National Defense White Paper, that explicitly stated that the People's Armed Police, which controls the Coast Guards, is not part of the official PLA structure. So my take on this is that uh, China's gray zone coercion is getting more gray on this like 50 shades of gray spectrum, but it's still <laughs> not to the point of say military coercion per se. So it still has this layer of um, plausible uh, deniability to it, but it's getting a little bit more gray than compared to say what. And if I may make a plug in the book on that. Um, Katian talks a lot about how gray zone issues are in generally very under theorized and in unspecific um, here in Washington DC. And I would, I would very much agree with that because if, if, you know, if you sort of throw everything into that blender um, uh, and sometimes you know, people will say like, oh well, China doing military activities around Taiwan is like the gray zone. I'm like, well, if that's the gray zone, that's, I don't know, that seems pretty black and white to me. Um, but Yes, you have a very great, and you know, plug for the book, very great conversation about why, how that is under-theorized and how we might start making more sense of it. Um, so on that note, it is one o'clock. Thank you all so much for watching, both, both in person and online. Um, thank you to our speakers for doing a great job, and congrats, Katian, on, a, on an excellent book. So thank you very much. Yep. Thank you so much. Go with God.